so what I want to talk about in the front yard is the bushes in the front yard first. I have these bushes that are natives. So I think the number one thing you can plant, if you put in your notes, is uh, native bushes and native trees. We are in Phoenix, Arizona, right? If you didn't know it, if you're from Montana, we're in Phoenix now. <laughs> what are some of the native trees that you guys should probably plant in your garden? You want to name some? Mesquite. Mesquite, Mesquite. Mesquite. number one. Wood. The ironwood, number two. Oh, the palo verde is amazing. How about hackberry. the hackberry, the net leaf hackberry, or the desert willow? Um, don't plant bougainvillea. How many of you guys know what bougainvillea is? Yeah. Keep your hands up. How many of you hate bougainvillea? Mm -hmm. If you guys put your hand on, you don't hate it and because you've never had to clean it up before. Because <laughs> you're the neighbor that makes all your other neighbors hate bougainvillea. It's just thorny, it never dies, the, le the flowers. Bougainvillea to me is really nice looking from the freeway when I'm driving down the 60 or something. But my, my neighbor has a nice looking one and it does actually look kind of pretty. But um, you don't need to put that kind of stuff. Put the useful plants like ironwood, mesquite. Palo Verde, the Desert Willow, Netleaf Hackberry. Every one of those trees also has edible stuff on it. The oh. Ironwood and the Palo Verde, the flowers are edible, and so are the pods. You can, when they're young and they're green, you can pop the seeds out and eat them like edamame. Mm. Ironwood and um, Palo Verde are that way. So is the shoestring acacia. It's also got an edible pea pod. The mesquite, of course, you guys know, put those yellow pods off. And to this day, I don't, the older I get, I'm 35 now, I don't understand why Every store in town here shouldn't have mesquite flowers right? super cheap because they're yeah. everywhere and then folks just throw them away. They just gather them up, throw them away. We should all have a mesquite tree. We should all save those yellow bean pods and then grind them in your kitchen, turn them into flour. Mm -hmm. It's sweet flour and it's mm -hmm. number one food source for the Hoho and the mm -hmm. natives for thousands of years here. Can you okay. grind the whole pod or just the seeds? Sure. Whole pod? Yeah, do it. Yeah, the whole <laughs> thing. Right. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I actually just was at Goodwill the other day and just browsing. And um, they had a mill there for like three bucks. Wow. And it's just a little hand crank one. It's, it's enough to just crank out like a yeah. single serving of mesquite flour for pancakes. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, okay. Any questions on the natives? So these native bushes in the front, I try to always prune back from the street. There's the brittle bush. There is the, uh, this one is called a wolfberry. Wolfberry is like a goji berry for the desert. It puts off edible red berries that you can eat. And it will look kind of dead eight months out of the year, but then when it yeah. when it thrives, it looks beautiful green, and then it puts it, the berries yeah, off. It's amazing. They look like little Roma tomatoes. And they're very delicious. They and when are. you go hiking, nobody yes. eats them because everybody's yeah, yeah, yeah. mom told them. Poisonous, yes. They saw that Brooke Shields movie, right. and they said, don't eat the red berries. <laughs> um, so next to the brittle bush is a very important uh, native bush that butterflies love called the, um, um, these are my name, thin leaf. It's a milkweed. So there's Arizona milkweed and there's the thin leaf milkweed. And those two bushes, the milkweed, you can get them from the Desert Botanical Gardens plant sale. They have a spring and fall sale. You guys ever been there before? Mm -hmm. The Desert Botanical Gardens uh -huh. plant sale? Uh -huh. Go, it's amazing. And they have all the native stuff there for very cheap and it supports the botanical garden. Way better to support the botanical garden than the zoo. There's no animals in prison in the botanical garden. Okay. <laughs> this one is a globe um, a mallow and that's an Indian mallow. <clears throat> so Indian mallow, globe mallow, are great for attracting pollinators like bees. Okay. So it's 8 o'clock right now, right? Yeah. Thanks for waking up with me this morning, by the way. <laughs> Is this early for anybody? Mm -hmm. no. You already Saturday. failed the first gardening test. On Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> On Saturday. <clears throat> On Saturday. Yeah. Well, thanks for getting up with me. Question about the natives. Do they, because they're adapted to grow in low... Um, organic material soil, do they struggle with the wood chips everywhere? If you notice, there's not a lot of wood chips yeah. around, around them. Okay. Um, but my ironwood and my mesquites love it. They do really oh, well back there. Okay. But these guys have no water system. They just are sitting in these concrete raised beds to block the tortoise and to block um, the wood chips and they just go off native rain. Yeah. So they look kind of deserty, but they are the language of butterfly and bee. So in college I studied Mandarin and I lived in China for a semester and that was my one of my majors was Asian studies. And if you go to China, you gotta speak Chinese, you gotta speak right. Mandarin. Right. If you go to gardening, you gotta speak the language of butterfly and bee, which is flower. So when butterflies and bees wake up and they see the brittle bush and the goji berry and the and the mallows, they come in. So in two hours from now, that Indian mallow with the orange flowers on top will be full of bees. And then the bees go, oh, what else is back here? And they come back and pollinate all my fruit trees. And I get swarms of butterflies. They love the passion fruit vine and the natives. 
And if you guys look at my neighbor over there or whatever else, they don't get any of the, any of the, of the butterflies. It's like night and day. Yeah. Zero butterflies across the street. Yeah. And I'm getting dive bombed by them over here. <laughs> so if we all work together, yeah. which is what classes like this are for, we can always you know, improve the ecosystem of our city because mm -hmm. Phoenix is more of a desert than it's ever been because of concrete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we bring back some of the native plants and garden, we're gonna bring that life back to the birds and insects and all that stuff. Make sense? Mm -hmm. and then we get to eat the results too. Yeah. So that's the welcome committee for the pollinating <laughs> insects. This tree right here with the little fruits on it, see the, see the green fruits? Mm -hmm. They'll dehydrate and turn red. It's called a jujube. Mm -hmm. And the jujube is a Chinese date. That's one of my oh. top 13 trees I'm gonna give you today. It used to be a top five list. Then it was a top 10 list. Now it's a top 13 list. And you're not allowed to grow anything other than on the list until you plant everything on the list. If anybody asks me about mango trees, I'm going to not answer that question until you have all 13 trees in the list planted, and then you can go to mango. So jujube is one of my top 13. There's different varieties of jujube, and they're fantastic. These guys up here with the, with the yellow pods down below and the green up top are moringa trees. How many of you have a moringa or have heard of moringa? How many of you heard of moringa from me? That scary to me because I should not be the authority of Moringa. <laughs> but I would say about four or five years ago, I began growing the Moringa. And at that time, um, not a lot of folks had them planted yet that I knew. So I had to meet some Lithuanian guy in the back alley of a Barnes and Noble. And it was like a drug transfer. He like pulled out these jugs with the little trees in them. And I got a six inch, two six inch trees. And then within a year, they were this size. Wow. They grew 15 feet in the first year. Wow. And then every spring, I cut them down to my height. I'm six one. Then they grow 15 more feet every year. If I don't cut them down, wow. they get too like kind of lanky and the monsoon can snap the limbs. So every year I cut them down and all that growth up top is in the last four or five months. That's wow. crazy. So and every leaf is edible. When about, when? what time do you cut? Like March. March. Yep. And they're a superfood, so they're a, like a multivitamin. So if you want to grow three trees that grow really well in Phoenix, jujube for the crunchy apples, if you let them dehydrate into a red date, they're very chewy and sweet, like a donut consistency. Mm. Number two is the moringa. And the moringa, you put the leaves or the flowers in your smoothie in the morning time and make a nutrient-dense smoothie. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. And three is the dates, a date palm. Where would you get a tree like that? The jujube? Yeah. All over. Um, <laughs> what is it? I don't see them a lot. <laughs> it's, it's difficult because I got that one from Baker Nursery before they closed. Baker was a big fruit tree nursery. I know that my friend Seamus O'Leary, he has some jujubes, but he has different varieties. So I would check with Seamus O'Leary. He also calls his place Green Life by Seamus O'Leary. And tell him Jake May sent you because he loves hearing my name over and over again. He loves it. Jake, what variety is that? That, that one's a Lee. Okay. In the back, there's a long and a contorted. So I like the Lee a lot. And so I would go to, sometimes Lowe's carries them. The beauty about Lowe's is you get a one year return policy. As long as you have some kind of dead looking thing and your credit card you've used, you can get a refund. <laughs> and um, any nursery in town, like Whitfill Nursery will have them. W-I-T-F-I-L-L, -L, Whitfill will have them. And any nursery that has fruit trees. Have you ever found that at Lowe's you get any diseased plants? Oh yeah. I worry about that. I have a theory that everything I bought from Ro from Lowe's dies 50% more than a local nursery. Yeah. Why is that? I have a theory. Every tree and plant I buy from Lowe's is much more difficult to get to live. Hmm. So I, I tend to bring things back more often to Lowe's and when I get it from a nursery local, it tends to always make it. And my theory is that I think that because they're a big con conglomerate, Home Depot or Lowe's, they're probably just feeding so much fertilizer to the tree in the nursery to get like, um, yeah. like a chicken company will give steroids to the chicken mm. to make it grow fast. Yeah. Yeah. And then you eat the steroids. Mm -hmm. They're probably doing that to trees to get them to grow fast. Yeah. Then you get them and they're starved because okay, they're in shock and they all die. Anybody work from Lowe's? <laughs> I'm sorry, Lowe's. <laughs> I know they have moringa now. It's crazy. Cool. My trees, cool, awesome. So they have these fifteen-dollar little square tall root 
system uh, citrus tree. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put all citrus hedges in. I was going to do all different kinds of stuff, and I said I'm just going to put in all citrus. Mm -hmm. So they're 15 bucks a piece. My thought was I could save a bunch of money, or should I wait and get them from Greg Peterson or from? Greg's trees tend to be really healthy. So like my hedge right here came from Greg Peterson a few years back. Okay. Um, but if you're going to do any fruit tree, like a citrus, for instance, right? right. You definitely should nurse it in. Okay. Remind me about that in a second. I'm gonna go in the shade with us and we'll talk more about that in a second. Okay. No, I don't have a hurry. But um, hold that thought. That's perfect. I'm gonna to touch on all that when we're in the shade in the back. But before we leave the sun here, I wanna talk about the moringa. Yeah, you guys see? So that's what happens. You get dive bombed. <laughs> that is healthy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's gonna be swerving away from it. Have a fig tree. Yeah, he he just wants to say hi. So make sure you guys. He's, like, he's looking for a cowboy hat to land on. <laughs> yes. The one thing about a moringa is you got to definitely. You got it. No, you got to put a fence around them because the rabbits. Oh. And they'll just devour them. Even if you've got a, a relatively a four foot moringa will be eaten by rabbits. Wow. wow. So you have to put you have to put a fence around them or some kind of protect chicken wire or something. Yeah. They'll take them. They'll do it in a day. And everybody has different pests. Like this gentleman has rabbits. I've got bird pests. How many of you guys have like gophers or? Everywhere else, so like, yeah, so everyone's got different pests. I have so many birds, it's like the Audubon Society back there. So most of my stuff is netted in, but I'm gonna talk about that too, protecting stuff from pests. Uh, but before we go on further, we have the Moringa. Okay, we have the Jujube. Um, that's in my top 13, and we have a date palm. So I just planted this one brand new, it's trying to make it, but I got 20 date palms on the property so far that are all female ones. So see the palm tree back there behind you guys? Yeah. Now look at these ones up here. Hi. Which ones are better? These guys or that or that one? Why is that one better? You can reach the fruit. Yeah. No. Because that one's got fruit on it. These ones got weeds. All the seeds on these guys just drop and create weeds down below. But the date palms, which you can tell by the look. Yeah. So the California fan palms look like fans. Yeah. And the date palms look like like a warrior. And you want a female one. That one's a female. And see, if you were to get a date off that tree and plant the seed, it might be a male. You might waste 20 years Ooh. of your life growing a male that only has pollen, which is, which is okay. But you might also waste because they always change their their variety every every line. So if you plant yeah. the seed of one date, I love this date. It's amazing. Plant the seed. It's a whole new date. Mm. Wow. Because it's a combination of the male pollen that pollinated it. <laughs> so the only way, if you love that date tree and you want the exact same date, see all the shoots down below? Yeah. You got to dig one of those shoots off. Huh. So date palm is probably number one tree I would say plant in Phoenix area for, mm. for fruit trees, date palm. If you don't have a date palm, you're not serious yet. But they're also the hardest to get and the most expensive when you buy them. So I would say try to find a date palm between $50 to $200 in that, in that range. You yes. have a shovel we can borrow? <laughs> Go talk to my neighbor, yeah. How do you tell a uh, male, female? You just start to know. I have a YouTube video about it. Okay. Go on YouTube and type in Jake Mace uh, date palm. Okay. And you'll find a bunch of date videos. Uh, and the male pollen looks different than the female cluster of flowers. The only way to tell is when they're when they're in the spring when they're fruiting, because the rest of the year they, they look the same. Wow. Um, but the pollen of one male can pollinate up to 50 females. Wow. Which everybody usually says in my class like typical. <laughs> but it's true. So you can actually take the pollen off, put it in your freezer, and save it, and hit each of your. So you just tap all the clusters of flowers when they come out of the female and then you get a, a buku amount of delicious dates and the whole process is on my YouTube channel. We don't have time to talk about dates too much but get a date palm, get a date palm, get a date palm. <laughs> yeah, any of them, a med jewel or anything. I got like 14 oh, different varieties. Mm. Wow. Yes? How do you harvest moringa when they're that tall? Well, we already harvest everything down below but we've been putting ladders up, up there. So oh. <clears throat> now that it's like here, I just go over here and just grab like this kind of stuff actually breaks off pretty easily. So this is like the leaves I would eat. So this morning I would just grab this, make a tea out of it, mm. or I would just hang it upside down in the back. We have like a hanging area mm -hmm. and I dry it and then crush it into a Vitamix and pulverize it to yeah. powder. Uh, so every morning in my smoothie, it's always two cactus fruits that I pick <clears throat> locally and um, a couple of spoonfuls of Moringa powder from my trees. Nice. This is supposed to be the cure to cancer. So hang on while mm. I cure my cancer with <laughs> They're supposed to have more protein than beef pound for pound, oh. more calcium than, than milk, more potassium than bananas, magnesium, a broad spectrum of minerals, supposed to be like a super, super food. Even NPR did an article, NPR News on the radio, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. guess it's an NPR? Yeah. It's not liberal, it's just mm -hmm. the facts. <laughs> <laughs> but NPR did a whole article how this is the new kale. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that should be number one on your list. The date pump, I think, number one. Because uh. date pumps can produce 300 pounds of dates per year. Wow. wow. That's crazy. And they'll live for 100 years, past your lifetime. And for the first 20, 30 years, you can reach it. Hmm. Only after a year like 20, 30, 40 do they get tall. So like hmm. that tree there is probably like a 25 year old or 30 year old tree. Mm -hmm. awesome. So a date palm, date palm, date palm. And only like a few places on earth date palms can grow. The Middle East mm, yeah. and here in Phoenix, maybe <laughs> Southern California. Like Florida, it's too wet for a lot of them. They tend to rot sometimes and have problems. Yes. I keep reading the stats I'm on gonna pass this around. and they go pound for pound, but I don't quite understand that. Is that because you have to like powder? Is that yeah. wet leaves? And, uh, yeah. and and to really equal the potassium, four times the potassium of a banana, do you have to have the same weight of a banana in moringa leaves, which is massive amounts? I'm just so curious about that. Mm. Nobody talks about what? Wow. Like, you are stressing. <laughs> I'm just curious. I would say, like I I would say just eat it. Because <laughs> the, the, the worst part is when I go to these gardening events, a lot of times talk about gardening, and the gardeners are all growing food, and then they all go out to McDonald's after the event. Yeah. <laughs> so just don't worry about how much to eat, just eat it every day. Yeah. Put it into your routine. Yeah. Get up in the morning, put it in your tea, put it in your smoothie. I even sprinkle it on like when I do like vegan macaroni and cheese. Yes, there is vegan macaroni and cheese. And I'll put moringa powder on top. You can't taste it, but it's in there. It's like my superfood nutrient. So secret. when you cut this down once a year, you say? Yeah, then then. Then you dry it all and harvest it all. It's amazing, yeah. And then I have a wood chipper that chips all the sticks and the tr and the, oh, and, the wow. and the trunk, so I can actually use it as mulch. Yeah. You got to plant them in April, so they have a full eight nine months to grow and get hardy before the winter hits. So get the seeds now because we always sell out and then um, plant them in April. In the ground, like this guy said, put a protective thing around them because these guys, when I first planted them, I had to guard them from the mailman. He was going to step on them. Okay. <laughs> and then within one year, I could do a hammock be be <coughs> between them. It was amazing. Who's gardening in raised beds? Who's okay. gardening in the ground directly? Who oh thinks in-ground gardening is better than raised beds? <laughs> A lot of folks think that. Let's all go over all the way to the gate and fill in that whole gap and go in front of those empty raised beds over there. If you're allergic to moringa, I'm not liable for what Let's transition just for a second and talk about raised beds. 